All right, during the season of Lent, we are looking at the cross as the wood between the worlds. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14, the Apostle Paul writes, May I never boast of anything except the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. On my writing desk, I have a Russian Orthodox Christ icon. I got it in Bethlehem from a Palestinian Christian icon dealer, I don't know, circa 2006. And it's always sat on my writing desk. I think of it as presiding over all the books I've written. I've written 11 books, that cross presides over them. On a writing day, the first thing I do is light a candle before that cross icon, and it presides over what I do. The cross icon, what it does, it's in the shape of a cross, you can see that there, and it takes you through the passion of Jesus to the resurrection. There are five scenes that are depicted in it. In those five scenes, there are 29 people and three angels. And as you look at it, you can see, there it is, you can say, oh, that's beautiful. Right? It's beautiful. But this is strange. Because four of the five scenes, the subject matter is grotesque. It is, in fact, depicting the torture and execution of a human being. How strange. This icon can be described as beauty emerging from the grotesque. Grotesque is a word that means, it means distorted to the point of being hideous and repulsively ugly. And so is it possible that beauty can come from the grotesque? Well, that's what this cross icon is accomplishing. And the grotesque beauty of that, of that cross icon can be possible only because it's true of the cross itself. The cross of Christ actually is where we find a grotesque beauty. And that's what I want to talk about. That's what I want to explore today. Now, from the very beginning of Christianity, the cross was central, always. And so the cross was preached. The cross was written written about in theology and other works, epistles. The cross was sung about, and the cross was signed in ritual gesture. That comes from the first century. Uh, Ignatius of Antioch, he died in 108. He says, the sign of the cross is a trophy raised against the power of the prince of the world. Tertullian, 155 to 220, he says, In all ordinary actions of life, we trace the sign of the cross on our foreheads. And so this ritual gesture of the sign of the cross, uh, it goes back to early Christianity. Now, I know some people say, well, well, well that's, that's Catholic. Well, not if you do it this way, then it's Orthodox. <laughs> I can do it either way. Uh, and I don't mind that it's Catholic or Orthodox. But I don't really primarily think of it like that. I think of it as early Christian. My first brothers and sisters, way back in the first century, they were, they were very early doing this. I like it. I like to make a liturgical gesture that says my life is defined by the cross. For I am crucified with Christ and it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Amen. So... In the early church, the cross was presented in sermons, writings, hymns, and in ritual gesture, but it was not depicted in image. They talked about it, they preached about it, they sung about it, and they made the sign of the cross, but they did not depict Christ crucified in religious art. Why is that? Because until crucifixion was abolished in the 4th century, it was just too disturbing. 
Because people were still being crucified in the Roman Empire until the early 4th century. And as long as that was still practiced to have a depiction of Christ crucified, it was just it was too provocative. To the pagan mind, it, it was just wildly incongruous to even think of the cross in religious terms. And so they made a concession and they didn't depict Christ crucified until crucifixion was abolished in the fourth century. Prior to that, the symbols, the Christian symbols were the anchor. That was very common and kind of an anchor cross, but it's an anchor. The fish, the ichthus, an acrostic for Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior. But the symbol of the fish was an early Christian symbol. Uh, a lamb and a shepherd both, those, those were Christian symbols. It was only after the abolition of crucifixion that crucifixes began to appear in churches, which, by the way, was an inevitable development. Because the cross is so central to everything Christian, eventually that image was going to find its way into the heart of faith. But in the earliest crucifixes, the horror and suffering of crucifixion uh, were avoided. Here's an example. This is, this is that's, a fish, that's known as, that's known as the, the holy face of Lucha. And it comes from like the 700s. Uh, if you want to call it, you know, kind of Google-eyed Jesus, I would understand why. I won't condemn you too much for that. But, but. now, this, this is how the earliest crucifixes appeared. What do we see? Well, we see Jesus as a Byzantine emperor. He's not naked. He's wearing a regal robe. He has a royal crown. It's not a crown of thorns. It's actually the kind of crown that a Byzantine emperor would wear. He's alive. Clearly he's alive. There's no hint of anguish or suffering. There's no blood. There's no wounds. And the nails are so tiny that you can't hardly see them. Jesus, in fact, is, is actually more in front of the cross than upon it. That's, that's how Jesus was first depicted in Christian art as crucified. But then there began to be a change. Around the year 970 in Cologne, Germany... The bishop there, Bishop Garrow, was building a new cathedral and he commissioned a new style of crucifix. And this is known as the Garrow Crucifix. And this is a little over a thousand years old. And this was, this was a new development. This was innovative. This was something new. It's, it's still there today. You can go to Cologne, Germany and see it. And here Christ is, is dead. You see him in death. His body sags upon the cross. His stomach bulges. There has been an introduction of an element of realism now into how Christ is depicted as crucified. And yet, it's still beautiful. You can still look at that, and, and you're, not, you're not saying that's entirely grotesque. What you're saying is, I see beauty emerging from the grotesque. I think maybe one of the supreme examples of this is Andrea Mantegna's crucifixion that he completed in 1459. This is a very, very famous painting. I mean, it's been on permanent display in the Louvre in Paris since 1798. It's very famous. And this is very interesting because the horror, the agony, the suffering is all there. Jesus is still alive, but you see he's clearly in agony. I don't know if you can see it that well uh, from, the, from where you're seated, but... His face portrays agony. He's suffering. You see the suffering of the other two that are crucified with him. Uh, you, you see just the inconsolable anguish of his mother as she collapses into the arms of the other women. And if you could look at their faces close, you see all of them are grieving. And then there's the, the callous disregard as the soldiers gamble for his clothing. So anguish, sorrow, grotesqueness, death, suffering are all present there. And yet, as you, as you pull back and look at it, you go, it's beautiful. It's beautiful. I mean, it hasn't been on permanent display in the Louvre since 1798 because it's ugly. But because it's beautiful. There's something going on here. 
How is it that we can do this? Um, it raises this question. Um, is it appropriate? Is it appropriate? First of all, I think it's, it's, it's somewhat of a miracle that we're actually able to pull it off. That we depict the crucifixion of Jesus Christ in terms of beauty. But it can, in some, it did for me years ago, many, many years ago, like in my 20s, 30s. I would question, is it appropriate to depict Christ as crucified in terms that are beautiful? There was a part of me, anyway, that, that protested and said, but it wasn't like that. And that's true in a sense. For example, if we had a journalistic photograph of the events of Good Friday, you know, someone from the Jerusalem Post went out there with their Pentax, their Sony camera, and took a photograph of the events that day. And it had been passed down now for 2,000 years. We, we have a journalistic photograph of Jesus of Nazareth crucified. If we had that, here's what I think would happen. We might look at it once, regret that we did, and never look at it again because it would be entirely abhorrent, repellent, disturbing, disgusting. And so, thus I've made this point, that if all you have is the raw data of what you could see with your physical eye occurring at Good Friday, there would be nothing attractive or beautiful about it. But that's not the end of the story. There's more going on there than the raw data of the crucifixion of a Galilean Jew by the Roman governor Pontius Pilate. This, in fact, is where the world is being saved. This, in fact, is where the sin of the world is being absorbed and recycled into forgiving grace. This is where God the Son from the cross says, Father, forgive. And you know what that is? You know what that is? That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So, what we have to come to understand, we've been looking at art pieces. You know, the Holy Face of Lucha, the Garrow Crucifix, um, Mantegna's crucifixion. And all of them have components of beauty. That's why they're either still on display in their cathedrals or have moved to the Louvre as works of art. Here's what we need to learn. The role of the artist is not that of the journalist. The journalist is just bringing us the raw data. Here's the facts. Here's what happened today. But it doesn't look beyond the material evidence. The role of the artist is different. The role of the artist is to alert us to what we may have overlooked. Someone tell me your favorite painter. Who's your favorite painter? Who said Van Gogh? Yeah, he always gets mentioned. We love Van Gogh. Van Gogh, you know, he never sold a painting. Ah, his brother brought some to help him out, but that didn't really count. You know, if the, only, if the only person buying your paintings is your brother, because you're broke. My, how things have changed. Van Gogh's most famous painting is Starry Night. If you want to see that, you'll have to go to, you can go to the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. That's where it is. And he's, it's, it's his famous, people love it. These swirls of stars and all of that. But I ask you, is that a one-to-one, -one realistic, journalistic reproduction of what a starry night looks like? If it's a clear night and you go outdoors and you look up at the stars, does it look exactly like that? Of course it doesn't. But that isn't what Van Gogh's trying to do. Van Gogh wants to wake you up. He's saying, hey, 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 you're, you're, you're sleepwalking through life. Pay attention. Wake up. 
Behold the beauty that's all around you. What Van Gogh is saying is, what I put on my canvas is what should occur in your soul when you behold the grandeur of a starry night. So, the artists who depict Christ crucified in terms of grotesque beauty are actually doing theological and I would say even pastoral and evangelistic work. They are alerting us to the beauty that in fact is there. That you might not be able to see immediately, but once you hear the gospel story and you know who this is and you know what is happening, you know that he is taking away the sin of the world and replacing it with the forgiving love of the Father. All of that's beautiful. The Greek philosophers, especially Plato and Plotinus, spoke of the true the good, and the beautiful. They didn't label it, later philosophers call it the transcendentals. The true, the good, and the beautiful. And these are realities that we desire for their own sake. The true and the good and the beautiful don't have to serve some other end. They don't have to serve some utilitarian objective. They don't have to make themselves practical and useful. We want the true because it's true. We want the good because it's good. We want the beautiful because it's beautiful. There's no no more to be said. Now, later on, the church fathers, who were very influenced by the Greek philosophers, said, oh, yes, the true, the good, and the beautiful, they are what they are because they are, in fact, Attributes of God. God is the ultimate true, good, beautiful. And out of that then came some traditions within Christianity. For example, we have within Christianity Christian apologetics. This is the venerable tradition of defending the truth claims of the Christian faith. And so when people attack the Christian faith, there's a response, a thoughtful response, a response uh, affirming the veracity and validity of the truth that is claimed in the Christian gospel. That's known as Christian apologetics in its best form. There are bad forms, but that's the good one. Then there's Christian ethics. This is attempting to define the good in light of Christ. The light of Christ shines upon us. The true light which enlightens every person has come into the world through Christ and we attempt to define what in fact is the good through Jesus Christ. And then there's Christian aesthetics. The pursuit of beauty. The attempt to create beauty. Here the church has been hit and miss. Sometimes the church leans into that, and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes the church is actively creating beauty in response to Christ. Other times, beauty is just sort of sloughed off as mere adornment and like it doesn't matter. Well, here's where we are today. Christian apologetics and ethics will always have a place. I mean, when done well. I've noticed people using the word apologists. You know, I'll see people that call themselves apologists, and what they really are is attack dogs. (laughs) They are are attacking other Christians who do not fall in line with their doctrinal tribe, and they say, I'm an apologist. No, you're just a jerk, and, you know, quit calling yourself an apologist. That's not what that is. But done well, I mean done in its best form, it's very legitimate and will always be so. Christian apologetics. Christian ethics is an ongoing project that must never be abandoned. And yet, let's just be honest. Let's be honest. Right now, 2024, in the Western world, increasingly post-Christian, the wider society is generally a little bit skeptical of Christians' claim to absolute truth and a superior ethic. In other words, if the church in the Western world 
in the early 21st century positions itself in the marketplace of ideas and says, I have an announcement to make. We have absolute truth and we know what's good for you. And we meet at 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. How's that going to go over? That's going to be met with something somewhere between shoulders shrugging indifference and outright contempt. And perhaps in some ways understandably so. But that leaves that third avenue. Beauty. Ah, beauty. Beauty Beauty's not confrontational. Beauty just allures. You fall in love with beauty. Beauty sneaks past your defenses. Somebody, I mean, truth and goodness, apologetics and ethics is certainly something we can fight about, and we do. Too much. Beauty on the other... Uh, Miguel Cervantes, author of Don Quixote, he says, it is the prerogative and charm of beauty to win hearts. It just, it just, we're just attracted to beauty. I think that's the avenue that's most open to us right now. Is if we can portray the beauty of Christ and then hopefully even begin to embody the beauty of Christ, that's the way forward in the time in which we're living You know, it was Fyodor Dostoevsky in his book, The Idiot, that wrote, Beauty will save the world. Just a little throwaway line in there a couple of times, but from the moment of its publication in 1869, that phrase just caught the imagination of philosophers and theologians and thinkers around the world. What does he mean? Beauty will save the world. In 1970, when Alexander Solzhenitsyn was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature, he built his whole Nobel lecture around that about Dostoevsky's enigmatic, enigmatic line that beauty will save the world. And, and what Solzhenitsyn said, it's not a riddle, it's a prophecy. Oh, I've always loved that. Beauty will save the world. But here's the, here's the issue with beauty. Beauty is, first of all, there's not many synonyms. I've written a whole book on beauty. Beauty will save the world. And in writing a book on beauty, I found out that there are precious few synonyms to beauty. You just kind of have to keep using that word. And, and there aren't any really good definitions. You can look up a definition in the dictionary. You'll, I don't even remember what it is. You'll read it and you go, eh, yeah. It's not wrong, but it's not really capturing the essence of it. Aristotle had a famous philosophical definition of beauty. Can't remember it either because it's, eh. It's okay, but it's, it isn't, that's not it. Beauty is something that's hard to define, but you know it when you see it. You go, dang, that's beautiful. Now, whatever beauty is, though, however it's defined, it does have something to do with form. With form. It's, whether we're talking about a, a, a poem or a painting or a sculpture or a song, or dance, or even film and novel. It's, it's structure, it's form. Is it balanced? Is it all those other things? It has to do with form. So if we're, in, if we're thinking about representing, enacting, embodying Christian aesthetics, that is the beauty of Christ in the world, what is the form? What is the beautiful form of the Christian faith? And you know. You know. It's the cruciform. Here's another famous painting. This one's also now in the Louvre. Calvary by Josie Liefernixa. It was completed somewhere around the year 1500. We don't know exactly. Something like that. Now it's in the Louvre. That is how the church is to be present in the world. Like that. Now think about, just, let's just keep it here at home. Let's just let's stay right here in the, the good old U.S. of A. And it's 2024. My God, it's an election year. Lord, save us. And now think about the church. Just the church, just, you know, just... The church. When I say church, it can be anything, but church. 
What is the presence and posture of the church in the world as witnessed by the wider culture? Does it look like that? Father, forgive them. Or is it... uh, Are we like this, the folded arms of disdain? Or worse yet, the clenched fist of angry protest? The wagging finger of heaping shame upon, shame on you. Not me, but you. Or worst of all, the pointing finger of accusation which is blame which is the work of the devil you 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 you're all going to hell (laughs) is it this is this beautiful no is this beautiful no is this beautiful no is this beautiful I mean, that's just a little bit removed from the ultimate gesture of contempt, if you know what I mean. Is that, is that, is that how the church is positioning itself in the world? It's this. It's that. It's present in the world. Arms outstretched and proffered embrace saying, Father, forgive them. for they know what. There's no argument there. There's no protest there. There's no shame being hurled there. There's no disdain. There's no contempt. It's just wide open. It's vulnerable. If you position yourself in the world like this, can you be hurt? Oh, yes, you can be hurt. Take up your cross, Jesus says. Yeah, but is it going to hurt? It might. But I'll be with you. I'll be with you. I will not forsake you. Paul says... I want to share the fellowship of his sufferings that I might fully participate in the reality of his resurrection. And so I'm, I'm, now, I'm now just much more modest in, in my, what I'm attempting to do at this moment. I'm just, I'm just speaking to, just to Word of Life Church. Word of Life Church, in person, online. Let's, let's put away our disdain. Put away our anger, put away our shaming, put away our accusing. Let's become beautiful like Jesus. Let's love, let's forgive. Put that up there one more time. Everybody look at that. Lord Jesus, you stretched out your arms of love upon the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us with your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of your name. Amen and amen. Stand up with me. How can the cross be beautiful? How can the crucifixion of Jesus Christ be beautiful? Because we see it in the light of resurrection. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world and opens the door to the world to come. There is the world that was and the world to come. And between those two worlds is the wood upon which the Son of God was hung. This is the wood between the worlds. And now let's come to the table. Well, today's a baptism Sunday. So let's, let's, let's invite those that are about to be baptized. For those of you about to be baptized, we salute you. <laughs> and would you come down here? All those that are about to be baptized, come here to the front. Stand right here in front of this communion table. Yeah, give them, give them a hand and, and they're making their way. Go, just, give, just continue to cheer them on. Beautiful, wonderful, hallelujah, makes me happy. 
Yeah, this is great. This is great. All right, get them, get them lined up, Pastor Derek. Get them lined up right. <clears throat> okay, what we're going to do uh, is we are going to, together, not just you all, but all of us together, we're going to confess um, the original baptismal creed of Christians. It goes back to the first century, 2,000 years old, that Christians would say these words right before being baptized. 2,000 years later, you're saying these words. We're not making something up new. We're doing what's been done for 2,000 years. We call it the Apostles' Creed. So, everyone, let's confess this creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now, we're going to confess our sins all together because we're all sinners, but we're all loved by God. And we're going to confess our sins because if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So join with me in making this confession. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And God is gracious to all who confess their sins. And in humility, ask for mercy. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. And this is the table, not of the church, but of the Lord. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little. You who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have felt come. Because it is the Lord who invites you. It is his will that those who want him should meet him here. The body of Christ broken for you. The blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. <clears throat>